non-critical care. Now, this is evidence-based management, but along with evidence, this is a master class. So I'm allowed a little leeway in telling you what I do, rather than telling you what the evidence is. But also, we'll uh, look critically at the evidence, including some new evidence or new guidelines from the endocrine society. Some of the new guidelines will be keep, kept in green at the bottom. So I think generally from what we have guidelines, the guideline says any adult admitted to the hospital, please ask for history of diabetes and check a casual plasma glucose at admission. So I think this part, most of you do. Anybody coming to the hospital for any reason, you will ask for history of diabetes. And also if there is no history or even if there is a history, you will ask for or you will check a casual plasma glucose. There is possibility of doing an HPA1C if you have history of diabetes, especially if you think uh, that this patient has not had a recent HPA1C in the last two to three months. And to label someone as having hyperglycemia, we use a cutoff of 140. And I think uh, this is very clear. This is from the older guidelines from 2012. And this has been adapted across the board in all the guidelines. Once you find that somebody has a blood sugar of more than 140, the options are to monitor him. You can monitor him with uh, point of care glucose machines, usually capillary pre-meals or Q4 hourly to 6 hourly. The new guidelines, that is the endocrine, uh, uh, the American Endocrine Society in 2022 suggested that you can use real-time CGM also in some hospitalized patients who are on insulin. But I think for most practical purposes, the still take home is we do uh, point of care capillary glucose measurements three to four times a day in hospitalized patients if there is a history of diabetes or if your first plasma glucose is more than 140. What do we have to do after that? And I think I'll uh, limit myself to what I call the seven golden rules. Now these seven golden rules are easy to remember and this is what I teach most medical students. I teach the surgeons, I teach uh, orthopedicians, if the orthopedicians can remember, I'm sure this audience will be able to remember the seven golden rules. The first golden rule I tell them is, when you go to your patient, you should know what your target is. Unless you know your target, you are not going to be able to achieve it. And the targets are fairly straightforward for critical care, for uh, almost all parts of the hospital except labor room, the target is to keep your glucose between 140 to 180. And these have not come from one or two studies. These have come from uh, lots of studies. In hospitalized patients, your target. So rule number one to remember is know your targets before you go to the patient, know what you're going to do. And the target is to keep it between 140 to 180. That also means that if your sugars are more than 180, you need to do some intervention. If you find glucose values staying more than 180 in hospital, you need to do some kind of intervention. The other end, 110 to 140, the only place in the hospital where I use a target like that is post CABG in the cardiothoracic ICU. Otherwise, other than labor room, most of the hospital, it would be 140 to 180. Second thing would I uh, slightly differ from many guidelines is what is called know your treatment. Know your treatment is to know what the patient was on before he came into the hospital. Now, most guidelines say don't use oral agents in the hospital, which is not really completely true for non-critical care. Patient has come with, uh, with dengue fever, eating normally. You don't need to stop all the medications that he was on. So my general recommendation, I think this is, again, only a guideline which says use oral agents is the Canadian guidelines, which says that unless there is a contraindication, use your pre-hospitalization OADs. There is no need to stop the pre-hospitalization OADs and switch every patient to insulin and have that two to three days where the insulin is, glucose is difficult to control. So use pre-hospitalization OADs unless or until it is contraindicated. That is my uh, use and that is uh, mentioned in the Canadian guidelines. Remember that many of these drugs have contraindications. Rule number three is if you are going to intervene, you find that your glucose values are staying above 180, above your target, you are going to intervene. The only intervention that is of any use in the hospital is insulin. And this was a guideline for most of the last 20 years. If you're going to start something new in your patient, use insulin. And again, this was uh, in the old guidelines, recommend insulin therapy as a preferred method for achieving glycemic control. But I think there is a slight change in the 2022 Endocrine Society guidelines. They have suggested uh, 
that in some patients you can use DPP-4 inhibitors along with correction insulin as a first-line uh, drug in patients who are not getting an H uh, a target of 180. So in hospital, if your sugars are slaying slightly above 180 and you want to avoid insulin, you can use DPP-4 as a first-line agent. So that is, I think, one correction or one new thing in the 2022 guidelines. Now, rule number four, I'm sure uh, Dr. Pratap will tell more about it. If you're going to use insulin, the first question to ask yourself is, does this patient require an insulin infusion? All emergencies, all urgencies, all critical patients, I think the treatment is use insulin infusion. Even in the ward, sometimes if your glucose control is horrendous, 400, 400, 500, staying all above 350, 400, use an infusion because that is the quickest way to get good glucose control. So emergencies, urgencies, critical patients, but also insulin resistance patients, very high sugars, use an infusion. If you're not going to use an infusion, then the rule is you should know what are the components of insulin therapy. And in hospital, uh, the important thing to remember is the components are labeled not as basal bolus, as basal nutrition and correction. So why we use the term nutrition instead of bolus? Because many patients in hospital may not be getting the uh, kind of three meals a day that you expect in outpatients. They may be getting NG feeds, they may be getting total parental nutrition, they may be getting IV fluids. So that is why whenever you plan your subcutaneous insulin therapy, ask yourself, have you given enough insulin for basal? This is how a plan looks like. Give enough basal, usually a long-acting insulin. Which long-acting insulin? I'm not going to discuss with you. It could be any of those long-acting, newer generations. It could even be the uh, twice-daily NPH if the patient cannot afford the newer long-acting. Bolus is usually rapid-acting or soluble insulin, mealtime insulin. But if it is NG feeds uh, and your, bolus, I mean, your patient is getting NG feeds every two hours, you have to use an appropriate insulin. And then finally, correction. And that is how the total daily insulin requirements will come and correction will be above it. Rule number six. Now, the only here uh, 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 change or new consult they have, uh, they have suggested in 2022 is not to do carbohydrate counting while the patient is in hospital. Carbohydrate counting we do in type one patients, those who are in outpatients, but in hospital, the current uh, only new change that has come in this uh, guideline is in 2022, they have suggested do not use carbohydrate counting. Now, this is something uh, very commonly we use. We, uh, I have a, a choreography move with my medical students. Whenever we go to a ward during rounds, if you're going to a surgery ward with medical students, and I see the surgeons doing what is called the sliding scale. So... We do, we stamp our leg and say thus bus. Thus stands for do not use sliding scale. Bus is now it is time to give up on sliding scale because sliding scale is using subcutaneous insulin just to do corrections. We have not looked for basal. We have not given the nutritional insulin and we are constantly correcting, which is uh, probably a very, very poor way of treating uh, inpatient diabetes. So we stamp our feet. If we see this happening in the hospital, and I get a consult and we tell them, please do not use sliding scale, use the three components, that is basal, nutrition, and correction, not just correction. Final rule that I have is to anticipate hypoglycemia and avoid it. And now what are these situations that we anticipate? Patient had his meal, vomited out. You can anticipate that he may go into hypoglycemia because if he has re already received his mealtime insulin. Patients, the surgeons come around, say, now keep the patient NPO and they forget that they have already given him insulin. So I think these are situations where you need to anticipate hypoglycemia and take corrections. Patients on inotropes, patients on steroid, suddenly it is withdrawn. These are situations where the basal requirement suddenly comes down, so you need to anticipate. So I think if you follow these seven golden rules, uh, most of the time you can manage most patients in the hospital if you, uh, with some of these rules, and I'm sure Dr. Pramila and uh, Dr. Pratap will tell us how they are going to use these rules in specific situations. Dr. Pratap is going to tell us how he's going to use it in critical care, and Dr. Pramila is going to tell us how they are going to use this rule. So I'll invite both of them to come over. Uh, who wants to start first? Dr. Pramila, you want to start first? So Dr. Pramila is now going to tell us in two specific situations how she's going to use this inpatient rules in patients who are perioperative and in patients who have come in for daycare procedures. procedures. 